Hey everyone, I'm Pratik, a dentist and specialty doctor, and in this video we're going to be looking at the ASA classification. If you want to see similar educational content to this, please make sure to subscribe to the channel and head over to Instagram to follow the Dental Notebook account. The ASA classification was developed by the American Society of Anesthesiologists, and it is a physical status classification that is used to assess and communicate a patient's pre-anesthetic comorbidities. It's a very widely and commonly used method for this purpose, and is standardised across most of medicine. By getting an ASA class, we can then effectively predict and potentially mitigate complications that a patient may experience perioperatively. It's been used for over 60 years with the latest revision happening in 2014 and the classification runs from a score of 1 to 6. The higher the number, the greater the risk of complications associated with anaesthesia. Although the ASA classification was started off as a method of assessing risk with anaesthesia, it has now broadly become a method of communicating a patient's general health status. In dentistry, the ASA classification, amongst a few other reasons, is most commonly used when it comes to assessing patients prior to sedation and general anaesthetics. So if we work through the classification, we have ASA 1. This is a patient who essentially has no medical problems whatsoever, they are fit and healthy, they don't smoke, minimal or no alcohol, and they have a BMI less than 30. It's relatively rare actually to find someone who is an ASA1. We then have ASA2, which is probably the most common of all of the classes. And this describes a patient with mild systemic disease, so someone who has a condition but it doesn't have any functional limitations. This includes patients who are active smokers, BMI between 30 and 40, pregnant patients, social alcohol consumption, Patients who have well-controlled conditions such as well-controlled diabetes, well-controlled hypertension, well-controlled epilepsy. And when we mention well-controlled diabetes, we rely upon the HbA1c for this. So remember the HbA1c is one of the methods that diabetics use to monitor their blood glucose. And anything less than seven is someone who's got quite a well-controlled blood glucose level. With ASA2 patients, we may have to consider making small adaptations to the work that we're going to do. Generally, ASA1 and 2 patients are safe to be treated in primary care settings. ASA3 describes severe systemic disease. So this is a disease that may lead to functional limitations but isn't incapacitating. So it includes poorly controlled conditions such as poorly controlled diabetes, poorly controlled asthma, poorly controlled hypertension or epilepsy. It also includes COPD, a patient who has had MI, a stroke or a TIA more than three months ago. And it also includes patients who have a high BMI, so those who have a BMI over 40. With these patients, we are more likely to consider carrying out changes to how we're managing them. We then have ASA4 patients. ASA4 patients are those who have a severe systemic disease that is a constant threat to life. So this would include poorly controlled COPD, patients who have had a recent MI, stroke or TIA, i.e. within the last three months, patients who are septic, or even patients with unstable angina, i.e. it's brought on without a stimulus. In these types of patients, elective treatment should be avoided, and where treatment is necessary, it should be referred to a hospital. ASA5 describes a moribund patient who will not survive without the operation or intervention. So this includes patients who have ruptured aneurysms or potentially been in massive trauma. And finally, we have ASA6. ASA6 describes a patient who has been declared brain dead but whose organs are being removed for donor purposes. So there we've looked at the ASA classification going from one to six. Now let's look at a couple of quick examples to see how we can apply the classification. So our first example is a 46 year old male who attends for a filling. They have a medical background of type two diabetes and asthma, and they smoke around five cigarettes a day. The HbA1c is 5% and they rarely require their salbutamol inhaler. So we've got a couple of things going on, but very quickly we can determine an ASA classification for this patient. Firstly, they're a type 2 diabetic, however the HbA1c is 5%, which tells us that it's well controlled. They're also an asthmatic, but they rarely use a salbutamol inhaler. So again, this is well controlled. And they're a smoker. All of these factors, a well-controlled diabetic, well-controlled asthmatic, and an active smoker fall into an ASA2 category. Let's look at another example. We have a 47-year-old female who attends for a checkup. She has a medical background of diabetes and heart problems. She tells you she had a heart attack two months ago. Her BMI is 33 and a HbA1c is 6%. So let's break this down again, similar to the last example. The patient is a diabetic and the HbA1c is 6%. So this is well-controlled diabetes. This would put them into an ASA2 category. They also have a BMI of 33. Again, this would be an ASA2 patient. However, the factor that is important to us in this example is that the patient had a myocardial infarction two months ago, and therefore, this immediately puts them into an ASA4 category. This is severe disease that is a constant threat to life. So I hope you found this video useful and the summary of the ASA classification helpful. 
It's a very quick and effective way to communicate even between specialties and like I said it's widely used around the medical world and having that standardised method of evaluation for a patient makes it a lot easier to communicate the patient's general health. If you did find the video useful please make sure to like, comment and subscribe. Until the next video, take care.